two, three. You're good to go. All right, thank you. Well, hello out there. I'm Mike Barnett. I serve as academic director of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh session in our inaugural quasi seminar series. These seminars are designed as debates on important topics related to social innovation. But our aim isn't to convince you that a certain perspective or answer is correct. We're not here to crown winners, as tempting as that may be. Instead, we want to enrich and refine the research questions that scholars use when studying these topics. As editors, reviewers, readers, writers, and teachers of the material underlying these debates, we know all too well that too much of the literature focuses on uninteresting questions that only rehash and rename established ideas. It's our sincere hope that by pointing out what is known on all sides of a debate in very pointed and direct ways, that we can drive researchers to produce sharper advances in our understanding of how to help business better serve society. Today, we debate the question, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there's no business case? Answering in the affirmative is the beast, man, talking about Wayne Eastman. Countering in the negative and telling us why it's not to be, it's to be sharding. A little stress there, I know. Uh, ethically leading us through all the contingencies, we got none other than JC superstar, Joanne Chula. And finally, moderating with all the ins insights she can shout, it's Danielle Warren. Each intern, I don't know, made it up as I went. Each intern will argue their position. Um, as they do so, please stay muted and post any questions or comments in the chat box. When we get to Danielle, she'll synthesize and extend the arguments as well as offer her own perspective. The open discussion will occur after all four of our presenters have spoken in the half hour or so that will remain thereafter. So let's get the party started. Over to you, Danielle. Thank you, Mike. Let me share my screen with you. Uh, so just to remind you, the title of our session is Can Ethics Drive Firms to Do the Right Thing if There is No Business Case? I am the moderator, AKA the philosopher wrangler. I will be wrangling our philosophers. Um, but we, we decided as a group to start off with a scenario written by Toby, the no business case for ethics scenario. Uh, I want you to think about Foxconn. Uh, Foxconn ma manufactures many of Apple's products, iPhones, iPads in China. Apple negotiated a highly favorable deal with Foxconn, thin margins for Foxconn and high profits for Apple. In part, as, as a result of its thin margins, Foxconn imposed inhumane working conditions, 12 hour shifts, six days a week, monitoring and controlling workers every movement, corporal punishment, crowded dorm conditions, separating workers in their dorms from others hailing from the same geographic area, and prohibiting socialization among workers. Such conditions are unethical. Because of its power and size, Apple had no business case to negotiate a deal that would, would allow Foxconn to treat workers ethically. So that's the scenario that all of our participants will be using. And I want to, at this point, I will stop sharing and pass this over to Wayne, who is going to say, yes, there is a business case. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> Ethics can, um, you, you fill in the blank. <laughs> <Wayne>. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Danielle. Yes, ethics can drive a firm to do the right thing, even when there is no business case. Okay, um, let's do the usual ritual we're all so accustomed to of screen sharing. Okay, see if I have the right one. Okay. And Okay, yes. Ethics can. Tim Cook's 115th dream. Oh, beloved Krishna, may I fight for ethics instead of my shareholders? May I pay Foxconn enough 
so their workers will not be corporally punished and otherwise mistreated, even though doing so will certainly cause Apple to make less money. As CEO, I do have the power to drive Apple's actions, but do I have ethical permission to act thusly? My dear Lord Krishna, now, I fear you will tell me I must fight for my shareholders, dear Krishna. Once you told Arjuna, the great warrior, it is far better to discharge one's own prescribed duties, even though faultily, than another's duties perfectly. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's, for to follow another's path is dangerous. What do you say to me now, O oh, wisest of the wise? I am sore afflicted. So now imagine Tim on the field of Dharma with the armies arrayed on both sides, casting aside his bow and arrows, sitting down on his chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. And now I will excuse myself for a moment to bring in our chief presenter, Danielle asked us to speak in the voice of our favorite philosopher. So I will excuse myself for a moment. Perhaps you can guess who my presenter is. I return as Lord Krishna, here depicted courtesy of Zoom Entertainment. Krishna will speak in terms of role ethics central in the Bhagavad Gita, and specifically of the four great roles, occupational groups, the Brahmins, the priests, the Kshatriya, the warriors, the Vaishyas, the merchants, and the Shudra, the laborers. Krishna's answer to Tim, Krishna will cover major ethical schools, part one, role ethics. While speaking learned words, O Tim, you are mourning what is not worthy of grief. You are a Vaishya, you are not a Kshatriya. It is Arjuna's duty as a warrior to obey the decision to fight or not to fight. But his duty is not your duty. It is your freedom and your kind's freedom as much as to figure out how best to work with the laborers, the Shudras, to provide sustenance for them, for the warriors like Arjuna, for the Brahmins, and for yourselves. You rank below Arjuna, but you have a choice in how to follow your duty to generate wealth that Arjuna does not have as a warrior. He is a wild beast who must be tamed. You are a tamed creature who hence has a choice. His duty to obey the collective is not yours, Yes, remember what I told you before. Destruction, what I told Arjuna before. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's. Others will oppose you when you act upon behalf of ethics. But yes, follow your own open-ended duty to create wealth, O Tim, not Arjuna's rigorously circumscribed duty to obey. Now, Krishna channels modern consequentialism through Jeremy Bentham and Joseph Heath of the University of Toronto, to my mind, the world's best business ethicist at this moment, working in a broadly consequentialist tradition. O oh, Tim, neither who thinks that the living entity is the slayer or that there is a slain, the firm is in knowledge, for there is neither a slayer nor a slain. The firm is only a tool for you and others. It is not your master or theirs. You can no more slay it than you can slay a hammer. You and the final judge of your conduct may follow Jeremy's doctrine which is closely related to your role as a vice shop. You may conclude that the diminishing marginal utility of income 
means that the greatest happiness for the greatest number is promoted by paying Foxconn more. Or you and the Supreme Judge may follow the doctrine of Professor Heath that managers should compete hard and correct for market failure. You may conclude that your firm's ability to pay Foxconn so little is dependent upon the unjust political economy of China and that the coercive, physically punishing conditions under which the Foxconn workers toil represent a failure of the free exit and voice conditions that underlie well-functioning markets. You may correct for those market failures by paying Foxconn more. Next part of the argument, deontology. Now, Krishna, speaking to Tim, will channel Immanuel Kant and David Rhodes, a professor at the University of Missouri. Perform your duty, O Tim, in equipoise, abandoning all attachment to consequences, to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. You and the judge of your actions may follow the doctrine of Emmanuel, which teaches you that you must choose to obey the moral law. Under that doctrine, you may reasonably conclude that you do have a duty to act on behalf of your firm. But you may also reasonably conclude that you have an overriding duty not to do so in a way that violates the categorical imperative by physically abusing workers whose situation you are responsible for. As a follower of Emmanuel, you may pay Foxconn more. Or you and the Supreme Judge may follow the doctrine of Professor Rhodes that the market economy you are responsible for depends on a large number of people having a visceral non-calculative rejection of cheating and other forms of opportunism. You may reasonably understand Apple's underpayment of Foxconn and yes, of taxing authorities around the world as cheating. Feeling thus, you may pay Foxconn and the tax man too more. And now our final major ethical school, virtue ethics. Krishna channels Aristotle, Krishna channels Alistair McIntyre, author of the wonderful book, After Virtue, which I highly recommend to any of us who have not become acquainted with it. Krishna. One who is enlightened has detached himself from sense objects as the tortoise has drawn its limbs within its shell. And this enlightened one is firmly fixed in perfect consciousness. As a great souled man, O oh Tim, you are above pettiness and above fear. You act calmly, knowing that others will oppose and persecute you, but secure in the refuge of your soul, for that is the only true refuge that there ever is. You and the judge may follow the doctrine of Aristotle, which teaches you that human flourishing, eudaimonia is the great end. Thus guided, you may cultivate your own flourishing and that of others by paying Foxconn more. Or you may follow the doctrine of Professor McIntyre, which teaches us that the modern war of principles and ideologies needs to be risen above. Thus guided by him, as well as by Aristotle, you may rise above the mundane spirits of calculation and anxiety. In calm equipoise, you may use your power to pay Foxconn more, untroubled by what your foes may then do. Krishna winds up to a conclusion. And now Krishna smiles, and so does Tim. Yes, O oh Tim, ethics, role ethics, consequentialism, deontology, virtue ethics, alike, all together, say that you may use your power to lead the firm to pay Foxconn more. And similarly, these schools of ethics converge to say 
that your final judge can uphold you permissibly. So say I to you, O oh Tim, and so say Jeremy, Professor Heath, Emmanuel, Professor Rose, Aristotle, and Professor McIntyre. End your moment of affliction, even as you smile upon us now, as you listen to my words, O oh Tim, be of good cheer. Now, in the remaining time I have, I'll just sort of translate the tone in which I advocated on behalf of the yes proposition into somewhat more prosaic language. Does Tim have a moral permission, a license under all major approaches to use his power to drive the decision contrary to the business case? He sure does. There is at the same time a correlative moral permission to others who oppose him to attempt to reverse or sanction his action. In other words, Tim does not have an overriding right that would create a correlative duty on the part of shareholders or others to say, oh, Tim is the man. No, to the extent a board of directors, shareholders, judges in Delaware or elsewhere determining the shareholder suit, you know, they have a, ro a role as well. But does Tim absolutely have permission or license? That's the can part of our debate. And that's why, yes, you should decide not in favor of, of course, of no, but also not if the wishy-washy, it depends. Because no, it doesn't. You always have that permission. You always do. The other side, and yes, there are foes, not just on the field of Dharma, but in life and in business in general, they have their own permission or license as well. So in other words, this is a case in which the position yes means, does Tim have permission to go ahead to exert his power? He absolutely does. Can it drive the firm? Yes, it can. Notice that this is an ethical debate. If anybody is interested, I would love to get into cases like Dodge v. Ford Motor, Smith v. Barlow, but then Danielle as moderator would have to say, no, no, this is not a legal debate, Wayne, and that's fine. But there is sometimes a relationship between law and ethics that might indeed be relevant here, okay? And that basically wraps it up for me. Um, the slide that um, Danielle covered, my sources. I, by the way, think role ethics is way underrated. I wrote a book more or less on that theme a couple of years ago. Um, it's included in your readings if anybody is interested. Um, in the peaceful side of things, Mike asked us all to suggest research questions that might be of interest. Uh, well, consistent with the theme of my uh, presentation, what is the role of role ethics normatively? I think it's thought of as something that is lesser somehow, but perhaps instead of thinking of business ethics as the application of general ethics of whatever kind to us, perhaps we think about it in terms of our distinctive role, perhaps less attention to the classic question of does ethics pay? I see the haunting image of Mike on screen, perhaps suggesting that I have exceeded or at least am about to exceed my time. So thank you. You ended just on time. Very good. Um, I got to say, I, I watched the Golden Globes and you were robbed. I mean, you should have certainly got that. But uh, and now we turn it over for an interpretive dance, I assume, to uh, to Toby. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to thank Wayne for a, uh, for, for, from my standpoint, what was just a brilliant presentation and brilliantly argued as well. Definitely presenting some challenges to me. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Mike for organizing this amazing uh, discussion and for inviting me to participate in it. Uh, thank you to Danielle for those amazing opening remarks. And of course, thank you to uh, Joanne for what is, uh, is, is coming later. Um, so, uh, oh, let me get my slides as well. So I considered how best to respond to Wayne and um, 
uh, to uh, to respond to Wayne and to give my uh, my answer of no is are my are my slides being shared? They are. I just want to hit the little uh, thing down at the bottom there, the screen, to uh, make it full screen to the left, yep. to the right. This See one? That thing? Nope. One more. Two more. One this more. One. There we go. Nope. No, sorry. <laughs> oh, this one. That one, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so in, in thinking about how I was going to respond to Wayne, I thought there are there are two main strategies that I could follow. Um, so I think that Wayne clearly showed that it is um, that ethics can drive businesses to act in ways for which there is no um, there is no business case. They they clearly can act in ways for which there is no business case, um, which is to say it's compatible with the laws of the physical universe that Tim Cook is going to pay Foxconn more money. No, no conflict there. Um, so in response to, uh, to, to, to that, I could say, well, it's possible in theory, but it's really just highly implausible in practice that any that, that Tim Cook is ever going to act that way. In other words, um, knowing what we know about business people, it, it's, it's not just unlikely, but it's vanishing unlikely that, that Tim Cook is going to make that, um, make that choice to act in accordance with role ethics or deontology or utilitarianism or virtue ethics, given the, the decision-making circumstances that he faces. That would be one strategy for responding. Um, another strategy is to try to muddy the waters for ethics. In other words, um, to try to show that businesses should, ethically speaking, that there's an ethics case for businesses to act only in ways that are compatible with the business case. Um, and so uh, that strategy is going to muddy the waters for Wayne and for ethics by showing that ethics is ambivalent in cases like Apple Foxconn. Um, it can, provide, it can provide grounds both for Apple giving Foxconn a more generous deal and for Apple to drive the hardest line possible in a business sense. Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to try to pursue both of those strategies um, at the same time. Um, uh, I've been a little stressed out today because we, uh, we lost our nanny coverage. So maybe uh, my daughter would like to participate. Um, uh, so I'm going to so I'm going to try to make the case for for both of those positions, or I'm going to pursue both of those strategies. That there is uh, that 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 it's highly unlikely that that um, uh, the business people will follow the ethical case when there's no business case. In fact, that it's so unlikely that we shouldn't even think of it as a possibility. Um, as well as the as well as the idea that ethics is ambivalent with respect to. Um, uh, with respect to this question. So I'll be talking about, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be providing grants to think that the right thing for firms to do is to increase their profits uh, to, uh, uh, I'll be arguing that it's, uh, so both that it's right for firms to increase their profits, that it's wrong for firms to act in ways for which there's no business purpose. And then finally, that uh, ethics can only drive individuals, ethics cannot, uh, ethics cannot drive firms. Okay. So point one, um, and here I'm, I'm turning to the uh, the, the most uh, the most well known and most promising um, uh, uh, intellectual source of of my argument, namely Milton Friedman. The right thing for firms to do is to increase their profits. And so this line I'm taking from Milton Friedman's uh, incredibly famous 1970 article from the from the New York Times Magazine. Social the social responsibility of business is to increase their profits. Um, and so according to Friedman's arguments, managers are legally obligated to pursue shareholders' directives, which generally are to increase profits. Now you might say, well, that's a, and <laughs> Wayne, brought up, Wayne, Wayne brought up this point as well. She's, she's shredding my notes back there. Um, so maybe that, <laughs> I, I think, uh, Wayne, I think that, I think that Margo's on your side. <laughs> Um, ah, well, I, I can't, I can neither reveal nor dis deny that we had conversations. <laughs> she's, she's, she's clearly sabotaging me. <laughs> so, oh, but here comes, here comes my rescuer. Um, so, um, so, so Wayne brought up the issue of ethics versus the law, and uh, so the, the same kind of issue could be could be raised with respect to uh, to to Friedman's notion of shareholders' legal obligations to the the uh, I'm sorry of a manager's legal obligations to the investors in the business. Um, 
I think that I think that the issue is a little bit deeper than the law uh, relating to property rights and ownerships, as well as to the foundational promise that managers make to shareholders, namely to uh, to 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 earn them a, a, a return on on their investment. Now, you could respond to that um, in a in a way that I think that uh, that that Wayne's presentation. Uh, uh, ably suggested, you could say, well, uh, um, managers can pursue um, a, a, a hybrid or, or dual role. They can simultaneously seek to increase profits and to do the right thing. So maybe, um, according to uh, according to 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 that view. Uh, Tim Cook is, isn't like rolling over for, for, for Foxconn and thinking about making the, the, the welfare of Foxconn workers like maximally luxurious, but he's saying, well, we can make, we have, we have, we have a little bit of wiggle room. So the problem for that kind of argument comes from, um, from Jensen's uh, a, a brilliant paper written by Jensen in 2002, published in Business Ethics Quarterly. So Jensen is well known as, um, as one of the authors that, um, that, that canonized the, the view of, of agency theory that, that Friedman is discussing in his article. And so the problem that Jensen points out is that if you don't have a single objective, the business is really adrift. So all of you know better than, than I do how difficult business decision-making is, how difficult it is for, uh, for, for firms to earn a profit or for even to, to stay in existence. Um, the the uh, the achievements that Apple uh, the, the the achievements of Apple Corporation are astounding and it, given the um, a hybrid a hybrid model uh, where the where the the managers both serve profits and serve ethics would undermine um, would undermine the business's efficiency would it would undermine its ability to get anything done so as it is we have a situation where um, uh, where Apple serves the, uh, the, the, the shareholders' interests and seeks to maximize, uh, maximize profits, fulfilling its duties, legal and ethical, to those investors. But then also they're generating maximal profits for the, uh, for the, for the investors. And here I'm um, um, falling back on Friedman's argument, which is that it should be up to the individual members of a corporation, including the investors, but also the employees, also the consumers, how they seek to serve ethical ends, what is important to them. So for some people, um, ensuring that poor workers uh, get a better deal, that's the most important thing. That's how they're going to devo devote their resources. Other people, there are lots of ethical problems in the world. Other people have other interests and they should, uh, ethically speaking, be empowered to serve their ethical interests as is best possible. And the way for them to serve their ethical interests is having the maximum amount of resources possible to pursue whatever ethical aims they, 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 uh, they view as most, most worthwhile. So that's point one. The right thing for firms to do is to increase their profits. Point two. Uh, so not only is it the right thing to do for firms to increase their profits, but there's grounds to think that it's unethical for businesses to act in ways regarding which there is no business case. And so here's where I'm trying to muddy the waters for Wayne. And uh, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne's um, presentation was admirable to the ex uh, in the extent to which it gave room to both sides um, in, in which he, he did acknowledge that there, there, there was room for the other side to argue. And so in my presentation, I'm going to try to push the other side, uh, that is to say the, the side saying that um, ethics, ethics directs firms to, uh, to pursue actions, to pursue only those actions for which there's a business case. Um, so I'm going to try to show that 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 argument is at least equal to the argument that businesses should serve ethics in in, in the respects in which um, that that Wayne mentioned um, at least at least equal and possibly overriding particularly in my view in the case of virtue ethics um, so I'm going to be talking about both Kantian ethics and virtue ethics. Um, I'm talking about I'm I'm talking about these views um, in a in a in a fairly general sense. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not I'm um, I'm not going to refer to the divergent viewpoints of particular of uh, of contemporary philosophers in the way that Wayne did, although I thought that was great. Um, rather, uh, the 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 contemporary sources that I'm citing, uh, Arnold and Bowie, a brilliant paper from 2003. If you haven't read it yet, you definitely should. And Solomon, 1992, also a brilliant paper. Uh, definitely very very much worth reading. I interpret those uh, those thinkers, Arnold and Bowie in the Kantian sense, Solomon in the uh, Aristotelian sense, as being very much in line with the original historical thinkers. Um, 
So from a Kantian, from a Kantian perspective, ethical actions must respect humanity, that's the, that's the, that, that's the, uh, the, the important part, by refraining from using people as instruments to benefit others. Uh, so refraining from using people as mere benefits to, as, as mere instruments to benefit others. So it's perfectly fine, according to Kantian ethics, to, uh, to use a person in order to benefit oneself, as long as you're not using them as an instrument, like um, like like an like an enslaved person, as long as the person who's being used as a means is also getting a benefit. So generally, the benefit, um, if you're using someone as a as a worker, the benefit would be um, a, a fair wage. And what's a, what's a fair wage? Well, it's the wage that the person agrees to. So Kantian ethics gives a lot of priority to the, the forms of decision making um, and the, the priority of human decision making um, in terms of uh, uh, what actions are permitted. Um, so, using, so applying Kantian ethics to this question, we see that in seeking non-business ends with shareholders capital, managers are using shareholders as mere instruments to uh, to seek ends that benefit managers, but not necessarily shareholders. Remember the um, the Apple investors may be very ethical people. They, they may have a lot of ethical concerns, but their ethical concerns may diverge from uh, from the particular ethical concern that we're that we're thinking about here. So therefore, I, I I surmise that it's unethical according to Kantian ethics for businesses to act in ways regarding which there is no business case. Secondly, and I think that this argument is, um, I think that I think the Kantian uh, the Kantian argument is pretty good, but I think the virtue ethics argument is really good. Um, and this this uh, this owes to um, Robert Solomon's. Uh, article from 1992. So he was both a um, renowned Aristotelian and a renowned business ethicist, and he brought these two uh, these two viewpoints together in this 1992 article. And uh, and one of the points that he makes in this article is that the virtues that constitute virtue ethics in, 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 in a business sense include business ethics, uh, includes business excellence. So making uh, uh, so acting in a way that is bad business for the company is, um, is against virtue ethics. Virtue ethics uh, implores companies to find ways of both upholding virtue and upholding good business. So, um, so I would say, so there, there might be some wiggle room uh, uh, here in terms of um, uh, pursuing actions that, uh, that, that further virtue and then uh, what, what constitutes business, business excellence. But there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of wiggle room here. So, um, so I think Apple is a great example of business excellence. It, 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 um, it has revolutionized industries. It has given us products that have, have, have changed, the, changed the way we live, have made the ways that we live much better. Um, it's definitely pursuing or definitely uh, 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 achieving business excellence. And you have to think, particularly looking back to Jensen's claim about the single-minded objective, could Apple have had those achievements if it had, if it had muddied the waters, if it said, well, you know, generally pursue profits, but also take these other concerns. Okay, so that so that's my demonstration that it is unethical for businesses to act in ways regarding which there is no business case. Um, and then finally, I have one more point to make um, that is a that's a that's a that's a, a broader point about ethical motivation um, more generally, and uh, and and is is in a way just thinking about the 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 construct of the the question that we're discussing today, um, which is just to uh, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there is no business case. Um, so in, in, Wayne's, um, in Wayne's presentation, he focused on Tim Cook, the, the CEO of Apple. Um, so in a, way, in a way, Wayne's presentation elides this question, but I think it, I think it does make an, an important point. Um, and so the, 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 the concern here is that ethics doesn't really drive firms. Ethics drives individuals. Um, so I have, a, I have an example um, uh, from, from Kantian ethics. And in Kantian ethics in particular, the, the, the drive to act, to act ethically is very important because of Kantian ethics focus on decision making. Um, so ethics fundamentally involves doing an action, doing an action because the, um, 
because the actor is motivated in the right way, because the actor is motivated to do the right thing. And so the concern here is that firms don't, don't, firms don't experience this kind of motivation. So uh, Tim Cook does experience this kind of motivation and Tim Cook has a lot of authority over Apple, but he's not the last word. Uh, there are a lot of people that, that come together and even, even Tim Cook's motivation doesn't fundamentally motivate Apple. So there's a second point that relates to this that's um, I think also helpful. So uh, and this relates this relates back to the to 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 my earlier um, thoughts about responding to Wayne's presentation by poking holes in the idea that well managers can act in this way, but is it really practical to think that they're going to? And so I'm looking at a um, it was a. a presidential address for the Society of Business Ethics from 1999, John Boatwright arguing that most managers are so far from being driven by ethics that the business ethicists shouldn't even really hold this up as an ideal. So thinking about um, like trying to get Tim Cook motivated by all of the amazing arguments that Wayne mentioned is really, it's really a non-starter because it's really, it's just, it's so, it's so implausible, it's so impractical that it's not going to happen. Rather, um, and I believe that this concern has actually been raised by a couple of people in the comments. Um, what, what business ethicists should be doing in thinking about um, getting firms to act in ethical ways is striving to develop market, uh, markets that produce ethical outcomes. And here, and this brings in um, Wayne's concern about the, uh, the unjust situation, uh, unjust political economy in China as well. Um, so I believe that's actually, it looks like I have a little more time, is that right? I gave, you plus I? Two. I gave you plus two for the toddler attack, but you pretty much used it at this point. Uh, all right, all right, then I'll, then I'll cut it off. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much for persevering through that. I mean, I had 911 on the speed dial just about. But, she was um, clearly, much, clearly aligned with Wade. Oh, I, I bet Q was behind this even, so <laughs> certainly something's afoot. All right, let's uh, now turn it over to uh, Joanne and see if what is in store, either artistically or Otherwise, uh, there. Well, hello, everyone. After these two brilliant presentations of my colleagues, I'm I feel like I'm at a uh, disadvantage here uh, with my mushy position of it depends, but I'll. Um, Start in a very important place Sorry, here. Can, can uh, you um, hit the uh, full screen? Uh, do I not here? have the full screen one? Okay, wait a minute. Let me hold on. Let me just go back. And well, just yeah, down at the bottom, yeah, the screen thing. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, maybe it's not going to do it. Uh, um, maybe okay. if you just enlarge it, then. Here we go. I got it. Okay. So now I, I'm going to start with Mark, Mike Barnett. And um, instead of putting a picture up of him, because you have a picture right there, this is a picture of Mike's office. And I put up this picture of Mike's office because of the sign that Mike put up, I don't know, years ago, it's been I up. I forgot around. what that place looks like, thank you. <laughs> I was just there. And notice the sign next to his office says lost. Well, when I was working on this, I was feeling a little lost. And so I turned to Mike. Now, what Mike has over the lost sign is an unreadable map of our offices, so it's not very helpful. But Mike actually wrote an article answering the question that we're talking about today. So I thought as an homage to Mike, I should at least read his article. And I found two things that were useful for framing up what I wanna talk about in the it depends argument. Uh, Mike makes a couple points in this argument about uh, the business case for CSR. Uh, he talks about a kind of pro-business case argument where he argues that it's better for businesses to just sort of do good things and that will improve their relationship with their stakeholders. So there we get a good business reason for why you should do good things, why you should behave ethically. And then there's a second argument in there I found interesting, and that is that the strategic use of CSR can hamper a firm's ability to build stakeholder relationships. And all of a sudden my philosophical antenna went up at that, and I wanna come back to that statement. And then he makes a very useful distinction, which you see often in business ethics literature, 
um, there is a really big difference between just behaving ethically towards stakeholders and actually doing something good for the community or a CSR initiative. And I think that distinction is very important. Um, in the article, he talks a little about stakeholder theory. I see Rob Phillips is here and uh, other friends who have worked in this area. And all I wanted to show in this slide is that, uh, you know, we go around, we have journals called Business and Society. We have courses called that Business and Society. And then there's all sorts of models. People make their own little uh, diagrams of what stakeholder theory looks like. So if you look at the one on, on one side, you've got the company that's a big blob in the middle. And what I want to say, and I'm not making any radical statements about stakeholder theory, is my diagram shows how tiny business is in the middle of everything else. So it's not really that I want to think about business and society as if it's contingent, but rather business in society uh, as if it is completely inseparable and a part of a much larger whole. Um, another person who's taken this position, and some of you may have read about this letter, was the famous letter by uh, David Barrett. Uh, he's the CEO of Expensify. Uh, he put a lot of business people uh, into having the vapors. He sent out a very partisan letter telling everyone that they should vote for Joe Biden because he feels he should protect democracy. This letter, by the way, is a fantastic letter to, to have your class read side by side with Milton Friedman. Because if you look at, I only put up two parts of it, uh, you know, he, he does these kind of questions like, who are you to do this? Because most people thought this was kind of an outrageous letter. Uh, but, you know, he says he has a right to free speech. But the second question of, you know, shouldn't you remain neutral as a country, company? He says, well, you know, Expensify depends on a functioning society. So in a sense, business is in society. If the society doesn't function, he says, you know, uh, not many expense reports get filed during a civil war. So it's sort of interesting to sort of take this view of business as in society. Uh, this would be contrary to the uh, separation thesis, the idea that ethics is completely separate from business. So I want to establish those two uh, ideas before we get to the rest of the argument. So there's two ethical considerations. One of them uh, is, is really brought up, well, it's brought up by both Wayne and Toby when they talked about ethical theory. In meta-ethics, which for those of you who aren't in philosophy, meta-ethics is the study of the logical properties of moral statements. It's the epistemology of morals. It is really the underpinning of ethics. And lately I've been very interested in meta-ethics because meta-ethics is, is how you begin to think uh, in better ways about building constructs for studying uh, ethics, both empirically and philosophically. But in meta-ethics, there's two notions. There's what's uh, about what motivates people, and I want to apply those notions to what motivates organizations. Uh, the first is internal moral motivation, the idea that moral judgments are self-motivating because we have a reason to do them. So if I say, I think, or I judge cheating on an exam is wrong, it would be illogical and strange for me to say, therefore I should cheat on exams, or I uh, am I'm motivated to cheat on exams because I think it's wrong, it doesn't make sense. And then there's what's called external moral motivation, which is probably a more common way of thinking about it. And that's that moral ju that judgments are related to desire, personality, and other things. So I might think, cheating on exams is wrong, and maybe I don't have the desire to cheat on an exam, or I may want to cheat on an exam because I desire an A. So, so these are two notions of moral motivation. Now, hold those for a minute. I'm going to come back to them because they're central to the argument. On the normative side, going back to one of Mike's comments about stakeholders using uh, CSR is a strategy. In other words, you know, using it for PR reasons or whatever can actually alienate people. This is a, a curious kind of argument. Um, it's, it's this, I, I think, a kind of misguided moralism that occurs sometimes. The idea that because uh, business does things that is in, are in their own self-interest, like McDonald's sells hamburgers and gives the profits to the Ronald McDonald House, because they do it in their own self-interest, they're not ethical. Well, that, that's actually not right, because having a goodwill 
or having good intentions or having a kind of moral purity when a business does something good doesn't necessarily mean that they're not doing something good. The Ronald McDonald House still gets the money. It still works the way it should. So one has to watch out for that kind of argument. And then the second one is in utilitarianism. And, and Mill makes this really interesting point in regard to Kant. He says the intent of an action. So if a company does some kind of CSR project and their intent is part of their strategy, as Mike has pointed out, um, that may tell you something about the ethics of the actor, according to Mill, might tell you about the company, but the result tells you about the ethics of the action. So you can still do good things with bad intentions. Now, the reason why I tell you this is I wanna to turn to another philosopher named Peter Singer. Peter Singer is an Australian philosopher. Uh, I'm showing you a picture of him with a sheep because one of the things he's most popular or best known for is his work on animal rights. Uh, so the sheep's probably happy uh, that he's there. So in a blog, Singer makes this statement, which is really about uh, the kind of internal kind of motivation for ethics that I want to press. He says, if you're living comfortably and other people are hungry, you're dying from easily preventable diseases and you do nothing about it, there's something wrong with your behavior. And I wanna be able to say that if you're an extremely wealthy uh, or, or uh, a fairly wealthy organization uh, living in the middle of poverty or located in a really poor area and you do nothing about it, that maybe there's something wrong with you too. Um, and then the second statement is also really, really important for my it depends argument. So the first one, I'm actually supporting the idea that you don't have to make a business case for ethics. The second one says, I assume it's when the, within the power of the affluent to reduce absolute poverty without sacrificing any of the comparable moral worth. Meaning you can make reductions in poverty without doing things that are unethical and also probably things that are harmful to you. So now here we turn to um, Milton Friedman for a minute, because one of the things that's interesting if you just look at the arguments in Friedman is that some of his arguments are basically arguments that it's harmful for businesses to do CSR kinds of things. And that's sort of a curious way of arguing the case because no one would disagree that a firm shouldn't do something should do something that's harmful to them. And this, this plays back to a point that I think Toby was making, um, that it would be ridiculous for a company to do a good thing that actually does terrible harm for them. Though maybe we could come up with some uh, interesting examples of it. So that's part of uh, Singer's idea that you should do good when you can and you shouldn't do harm. So my last point, that I wanna make that puts the argument together is two things. The first is ought implies can. So I wanna argue that businesses that can do good things ought to do good things. I also wanna argue that there's something wrong with a business that is operating either surrounded by poverty or need or other such things that require some kind of attention that cannot be given by government or other things that, that they have an absolute obligation to do it and that there's something wrong with them if they don't. And um, nobody expects a business to do something that they can't do or is going to destroy them. And so here we turn to the case of Roy Vagelo. So we've talked about Foxconn and he's the CEO of Merck when they donated the money to um, the medicines that they invented uh, to cure river blindness. It's what's interesting about this case, so you're all familiar with the river blindness case, but there's another part of it that has to do with the history of, of Merck that's interesting. And that is that during World War II or after World War II, um, Merck donated a bunch of streptomycin to the Japanese. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that was many, many, many years ago. And then we fast forward to the 80s. One of the things uh, that's significant about that is that the Japanese didn't forget. And Merck was one of the first 
he was among the first pharmaceutical companies to be allowed to operate in Japan. Sometimes when a company does good, you don't get an immediate return, nor do you know what that return will be. That's just not a practical observation. It's also an observation about ethics in general, that ethics does require a kind of leap of faith. We, do, we may do the moral things every day and not know if there's a payoff from them, not be able to imagine a payoff from them. We want to think that ethics doing the right thing is an intrinsically good thing to do, but very often good things happen that we can't foresee. So having to make the business case when you can't always foresee what the ends will be of doing something good um, is perfectly fine and it's perfectly uh, important as a part of what ethics is actually about. So let's look at my depends argument. So when we say uh, we need, you need to make the business case, what I want to argue is that when a business wants to undertake a CSR initiative, they have to show that it can't or it will not harm the business. And also that it's something that the business can do well or appropriately. And certainly there's lots of literature on this and what are appropriate CSR projects. And then the second is that going back to the Merck case, what I also find interesting about it, first of all, is the leadership of uh, their CEO in it. And there's been a lot written on that and I've written, some, written something on that. But also the fact that when industries, when companies and industries take these initiatives, they take on a kind of uh, moral leadership in the industry. And what was interesting after the Merck case is that all of a sudden a bunch of other major pharmaceutical companies started doing similar things, whether it was you know, filters to water filters to filter parasites out or mosquito nets or any of those kinds of things. Uh, there's a kind of peer pressure that you, you create that in a way, going back to Peter Singer's case, you look bad if you're not doing it because so-and-so did it and they made a big splash. There's a German expression, it's, it's do good and talk about it. That's not always a bad thing, especially when you raise the norms within the industry. And I think individual leaders and companies can take leadership in creating the kind of situation that Singer talks about of making it seem odd when a company does not attempt to do the right thing. So now the no need to make a business case I've already talked about. First of all, the idea is that business is in society and is a player in everything that goes on. So I'm taking a much more integrated look at it and the fact that ethics is in any way separate uh, doesn't really make sense because society, government, and all those external things in, in stakeholder theory are what make a business possible. And so I don't think there's any separation there. Um, it logically and morally follows that when a business sees something wrong, especially if it's appropriate, it's in their community, it's, it's in uh, the area they do business, they need to do something about it. And it, it should start to look bad. And the one reference here we're thinking about is, is all of these you know, billionaires we have now, especially the uh, tech billionaires. There comes a point where it starts to look almost odd. And again, this is cultural too in American culture, but I would argue in some other cultures as well, it begins to look odd if they don't start giving their money away. Obviously, Bill Gates is a great example of this, but you know, when you have billions of dollars, you, you have a lot of potential to help other people. If you don't, as Singer says, it looks odd. It seems odd. It seems like there's something almost wrong with them. And that's a good thing. And then of course, lastly, doing the right thing requires a leap of faith. And I think that is part of why you don't need to make the business case is, is that. And in ethics and in societies and organizations, when people lose faith, in, in the fact that doing good will turn out well. It's the reason why we don't have children's books where the bad guy wins. It's the reason why things have to turn out well when people do the right thing. Um, we need to believe that. Now, not all organizations believe it, not all business people believe it, not all individuals believe it, but all of ethical behavior requires that leap. Uh, and and you, it's into the darkness because 
sometimes it appears it's not going to turn out. Sometimes your best judgment is doing the right thing is going to be horrible for you, but you need to believe otherwise. And lastly, the new research question. So I think instead of asking uh, the question we have today, it might be useful to ask, why don't firms use their resources to help others? What's their excuse? What's their reason? Now, I know this all sounds heresy, like heresy compared to um, what someone like Friedman might say. And of course, as, as Toby has nicely pointed out, you know, businesses are supposed to be there creating value, doing all these other things. But the point is, it, it would be interesting to go around and say, you know, why don't you do this and see if they really have good reasons for it. And that I'm not so sure. And one last Aristotelian point on this, um, going back to Toby, is that, that the interesting thing about uh, the way that the Greeks, uh, Plato and Aristotle, thought about ethics is they never, because arete meant excellence, they never saw the separation between uh, moral knowledge and moral action and technical excellence. Uh, to be good at something meant that you were not only technically good at it, but you were morally good at it. And I think it's a really uh, rich way, and I, I'm glad she brought it up, it's a really rich way to think about the obligation. So in the end, I probably end up on the no side. I'm, I'm probably ending there, uh, but I think that the pens are really important because there's a lot of straw man arguments out there, a lot of arguments that make it sound totally ridiculous for people to engage in these things. And I'd like to say, beware of the straw man because the straw man, uh, first of all, doesn't exist and is often an excuse in cases where businesses that can do more don't. So I will leave it at that. I, I hope I'm not over time. Am I on time? Yeah, you're, you're way over time, but. <laughs> Am I? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that I'm sorry. That, that was that bleep, bleep, bleep sound that I threw in there a few minutes back, but oh. thank you very much. And I, I think, you know, we don't want to bury the lead here, but if I understand it correctly, we've concluded that Joanne Chula agrees with Milton Friedman. Is that? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay. All right, so now let's uh, turn it over to put it all together and uh, leave us on a perfectly clear note is uh, Danielle Warren. Yes, that's my job. I had to keep track of my colleagues arguments while trying to not get distracted by the chat that was going on, which was very interesting. We will get to your points in a minute and you're going to have an opportunity to participate all of you in cyberspace. I want to remind you first uh, our question is, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there is no business case? And we were considering at the start uh, this scenario written by Toby, the no business case for ethics. It was about Foxconn. For those of you who joined late, Foxconn uh, manufactures Apple's products. Apple negotiated a highly favorable deal with Foxconn, thin margins for Foxconn and high profits for Apple. And Foxconn has imposed inhumane working conditions and that these conditions are argued to be unethical. And because of its power and size, Apple had no business case to negotiate a deal that would allow Foxconn to treat workers ethically. And we heard from Wayne, yes, ethics can drive firms to do the right thing if there is no business case. Many normative approaches, virtue ethics, consequentialism, deontology, support the humane treatment of workers even when the business case does not support it. We heard from Toby, no, ethics cannot drive firms to do the right thing if there's no business case. Firms do not have ethics, people have ethics. Firms were created to generate profits, using them for other purposes is unethical. And we heard that there were some problems with the question, or I foresaw some of you raising some issues with the question itself. Uh, if the business case determines what is ethical, pursuing profits equals ethical, ethical, then following the business case is the only ethical option. Business case versus ethics is a false dichotomy because business case equals ethics. So that would be one, one argument uh, associated with the question that we're being asked. A second problem with the question one might raise. If the business case is not a normative concept, then it is a false dichotomy to say business case versus ethics. 
it would be similar to asking people, which would you choose, an orange or ethics? They're just not relatable concepts. But we, we did hear arguments from all three of our folks on the debate uh, debating this question, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there's no business case? We have Wayne who argued yes, Toby who argued no, Joanne who argued maybe, and now Deborah is going to launch a poll so you all can weigh in on which one. Deborah, do you see the poll? There we go. Oh. Great. So I love for you all to chime in. Don't give us your reasons now, but when we get to the Q&A, it would be fun to hear some of the logic. I mean, I've read some of it in the chat. I've been my head spinning because the conversation is moving rather rapidly in the chat. But please take a moment and weigh in. I, I promise I'm not going to cold call you depending on, on what, which option you choose. Uh, I only do that to, to my students. Uh, I'll give you a, a couple of more seconds here to weigh in. We've got a good, oh, we've got a really good response time. We, we, we got a, oh, it's closed already. So I'm, I'll, I'll briefly share the results and then we'll talk about them once I'm done with my slides. Host is sharing results. Okay, that's me. All right, so it looks like yes, yes is in the lead. Well done, Wayne. All right. <laughs> So, uh, I, may I, wait a second. May I raise a protest on behalf of Toby and of Joanne? I think I had power as co host to close the poll. And so I call the poll invalid. I, <laughs> I accidentally closed the poll, or maybe accidentally. Are you saying? Perfect. Like my conversation with Margot. I mean, I just have. Sometimes you got to be ethical. I'm sorry. Oh, unethical, Wayne. Least unethical. ethical guy, but I think I closed. So, the so you closed the polls while you were ahead. Is that and what while you're saying? I was ahead. Okay. While I was ahead. I'm just saying. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the folks from the. Wrong. The folks Maybe from the. You, closed it. Yeah, I, I was going to say the folks in the U.S. are just feeling all sorts of emotions when you tell us that you've closed the polls early while you were ahead. But I won't say more about that right now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my results and move forward with my presentation. So for my next part of my presentation, now that we've got done with the polls, I want to nitpick the question some more, but from a different perspective. We were asked, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there's no business case? We were not asked, should ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there is no business case. Considering can is a useful endeavor, even for philosophers, as Joanne noted, because normative theories that cannot be followed by people are not very useful. So if we say that all humans should behave like and think like Mr. Spock, that might not be a very reasonable thing to, um, to suggest because we don't have the mental capacity uh, to think like Mr. Spock. So can suggest an empirical question which would be answered by empirical research. So the rest of my presentation will focus on empirical research that we might want to conduct. So first, uh, is the business case a form of ethic that is most salient to business people? If so, where did they learn it? Did they learn it from us? What can be done to expand the menu of ethical rationales used by business people? Could we offer them a menu, the good citizen option, the social welfare option, or uh, Sandra mentioned the collective value option. So we could say you could follow this one, that one, the other one, or can we simply expand and broaden the conceptualization of the business case so it includes ethics? And I would argue that I, I think we've slowly done so for many years. Um, I teach, I have been teaching undergraduate business ethics for over 20 years now. And I have noticed that, you know, early on when I proposed ideas like corporate social reporting or socially re responsible investing or even corporate values to my students, they would think, huh, that sounds strange. And now it sounds perfectly normal when I introduce it in class and they recognize it as a norm. And today, we actually have 
socially responsible investing, which would consider something like humane work conditions as a dimension used to choose firms for investments. So arguably the business case is becoming broader with time and we are starting to factor in some of these things that we may uh, categorize as ethical issues. Okay, other avenues for research. We should study firms that followed ethics when there was no business case. I suggest we look at not only successful firms, moderately successful firms, but I also think we should look at bankrupt firms. And when I say bankrupt firms, I'm, I'm speaking of financially but not morally bankrupt firms. I think there's a lot to learn from bankrupt firms, especially those that can't stay in business without violating ethical standards. For instance, if they can't stay in business without engaging in inhumane work conditions and choose to go out of business, that would be an interesting firm to study. Um, and as I was typing up my slides, I was reminded of this concept that Ryan Berg had mentioned to me. Uh, he had this concept of firm euthanasia. And this was when he was a doctoral student. He had this idea of firms killing themselves if they had no positive impact on society, if they only harmed society. So you could imagine a firm that makes cement life jackets uh, decides to close up shop because they can't do any good. They're only doing harm. And uh, the reason why I, I sort of laugh as I'm telling you about this is that he wanted to, to conduct this research as part of his dissertation. And I was part of a group of individuals that persuaded him otherwise. His advisor really was against this um, because we were trying to impress upon him. If you're trying to get a job at a business school, it might be difficult if your dissertation focuses on firms killing themselves. That's probably not a strong sell when you're on the job market. So I'm telling you all of that, uh, or telling you about this because I know we have doctoral students on the call right now. I suggest you may want to study this, but not as your dissertation. Okay, other avenues that we may want to pursue. We could focus on when ethics drive firms, when ethics drives firms to do the right thing if there's no business case. So does the size of the ethical violation matter? Is there a tipping point? I could imagine studying this both, you know, empirically in the field, in, in lab studies, where you see if if the ethical violation is large enough, um, will it cause a firm to uh, accept certain losses? And just because it's hard to sleep at night if you were to engage in that business practice. So we could imagine maybe something like inhumane work conditions are just too much to bear and the firm is willing to um, take losses uh, just so that they don't engage in this ethical violation. So those were some of the questions that I could imagine arising from um, this from this overall question that we've been given. And I'm now interested in hearing what your questions are. And I see, oh my goodness, while I was speaking, 25 new ones showed up in my chat. Goodness. Okay, so Mike, how would you like to organize things? So I'm glad to let you lead the uh, discussion. Um, if you want to pick questions, or sometimes I just say panelists, pick your favorite question, cherry pick which one you want to answer or ask each other questions, um, however you like. Okay, so I, I haven't seen the 25 that came in while I was presenting, but there was one that I thought was really good while the other folks were presenting. And that one was, there seemed to be some folks that were curious about what we mean by the business case. So they were asking for definitions, like what does it mean we're all talking about the business case. What does the business case actually entail? And I just thought maybe that's something that all three panelists could say something about. Um, yeah, Wayne? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll start on and sort of doing that. I, you know, I liked a lot when Toby came up with our scenario, both because I think it's a great scenario and because it gave me on the yes side some room to work with my for what it's worth not that one's own opinion really matters but for years i beat the drum on the idea that the hard heads you know those who incline toward a freedmanite kind of position you know and those of us who are less sympathetic to it also 
we really, really need to be thinking in terms of the tensions between a 100% shareholder, which is what we really think about, and actual diversified shareholders. So it strikes me that there is just a very mainstream Michael Jensen financial economics case to be made that Apple should be maximizing on behalf not of 100% shareholders who might include Tim himself, but on behalf of the actual diversified portfolio of, of Apple shareholders. They don't want things that are going to just benefit the company. That works a lot better for scandals, say like Danielle, your last period bankruptcy example, I think is great. You know, sure, does it help WorldCom or somebody to finagle? Does it help the market to finagle? Not one little bit. So, you know, my own belief on the business case is that it really, really, you know, suffers from a reflexive equation of undiversified shareholders with the group we're talking about. Um, none of this should be confused with my opinions personally, which were all given to me by a combination of Krishna and Mark. Okay. That's all I have to say. Joanne, would you like to weigh in? You're still muted. Sure. Yeah, I got it. Um, sure. I mean, I, wh when I first saw the question, I had that question too. What's the business case? Is it, is it going to be just, you know, stockholders? Um, I took it more as the Milton Friedman argument. But I also think that that... It, it's a slippery idea because part of the concept is, is this question forces you to reconceptualize what business is in relation to society because the business case works as a very narrow one, uh, a stockholder only kind of case, if that's how you see business in society. If you see business as an integrated part of it, the business case becomes much more nuanced. That's why the depends part is important because it really raises the question, you know, what should businesses be doing? So, so I took it as the narrow one and I don't know what, what um, the actual question was supposed to mean, but that, that's all I took. Um, Toby, what did you do? Uh, so I also I also took it in the in the narrow sense. Actually, one of the reasons that I thought that the Apple Foxconn case was so interesting was that um, so Apple uh, during the, um, the 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 spate of suicides of Foxconn employees, um, uh, I guess it was between 2010 and 2014, Apple essentially was not punished by consumers for that. As as awful as that was, it was hundreds of people. Um, uh, uh, committing suicide, protesting, attempting to commit suicide unsuccessfully. Um, it was it was an, an awful human rights, um, uh, uh, human uh, a catastrophe for human welfare. Um, but Apple was not punished. And I thought that was that was that really just reinforced that Apple didn't have that narrow business case to make changes to its um, its, uh, its 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 relationship with Foxconn. Now, of course, Although Fox, uh, although Apple was was not punished by consumers, or was not uh, apparently punished by consumers, they did ultimately make some changes to uh, to help the workers that were manufacturing their products. As far as I know, the the deals with Foxconn didn't change, but the the resources that Apple um, contributed to. Uh, to the to to worker welfare did change, and they did they did make contributions to um, like they 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 hired uh, they hired therapists to to work with the employees. They built um, uh, recreation areas where they could relax. I believe that the uh, the the restriction on socializing with um, uh, on, on restricting socialization with people who were from the same area as you, uh, they 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 uh, they asked Foxconn to lift that restriction. Foxconn did lift that restriction, so they did make changes. I thought that that ultimately uh, fed into um, uh, Joanne's later point about like is you know is this something that you can really is this is 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 this something that you can that you can live with even if there's even if there's no business case for it. Um, but uh, the short answer is I, I interpreted it in the, 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 the same narrow way. And I take the, uh, take the, the criticisms of that, that narrow approach. Mike wrote the question. 
So Mike, <laughs> what's the business case, Mike? This is the case for anything. It's just, can you make money doing it, right? Is there a way to get returns in excess of what it costs you to do it? It's as simple as that. And you don't believe that ethics is part of the business case? Um, it could be built. It, it depends on who's holding them accountable. So ultimately it defaults to, to primary stakeholders, whether or not they're going to reward and punish firms for these actions. And so if the people who buy your stuff and provide your inputs and process all of those things, all of your different stakeholders, if they believe that they do business with you on more favorable terms because you do ethical things, then yes, there's a business case for it. Uh, if not, then you're screwed, right? You've got to decide whether or not to continue to do business in ways that satisfy those stakeholders and get you the money uh, and all the resources that you need if it has to come at the expense of what you think is ethical. Okay. Thank you. And so I, I, lots of questions are popping up. Now we have ones at uh, regarding suicide rates. But before we go there, I'm just wondering, um, there was some debate about the legality of following something other than maximizing profits. And so there was some back and forth about that. And given Wayne's legal background, I thought Wayne might want to weigh in for the folks that might have uh, lost track of the debate in the chat. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this sort of, you know, much as I would have been happy to argue the other side, um, I'm still a lawyer at heart after all. Um, you know, I did have a feeling with my sort of years of legal practice, yeah, the yes side is just pretty strong in terms of American law because just notwithstanding the idea that the US is seen as if anything an outlier in international um, political economies on the pro shareholder side along perhaps with Britain, we are really all that deferential toward ethically based managerial conduct. Um, so unless you outright say as a firm, we are defying the wishes of our shareholders and the interests of our shareholders, it's all fine. It's all fine. That is, even for those who like the Dodge v. Ford motor case as an upholding, because Henry Ford was using his control of Ford, he uh, changed dividend policies in a way that made the Dodge brothers mad, the Dodges sued, Ford was ordered the company, and Henry Ford is the majority shareholder, pay out half of your cash surplus. But he only lost because he basically stuck a pin in the eye of the shareholders in his depositions by saying, these are awful profits. We've got to help society. All you have to do is give a motivation for your actions, which might, by the way, I don't recommend that a firm try this, but if they tried my managing on behalf of all shareholders, diversified shareholders, that would probably work. Somebody, um, Dia Roscoe had very good comments on that that I'll sort of yield to in the chat to the effect that Delaware law is just under the business judgment rule, all that differential, all that deferential. Yes, you can do this. Our own Smith v. Barlow, any of you who want to sort of do law and ethics, there's amazing language by the 1950s New Jersey Supreme Court that basically says corporations nowadays are about society, okay? And if you wanna turn that back and say that was the 50s, now we're hard nosed again and Toby should win, that's fine, okay? But quickly, legally, I just think this debate is not much of a debate in terms of giving leeway to firms to act ethically, um, notwithstanding shareholders being grumpy. Yup, you can do it. All right, you guys, you take that snippet and show it to your shareholders. <laughs> if they give you any complaints, oh, Wayne says, I can do this. Um, yeah, may, maybe you're no longer CEO or, you know, a Raider has taken over anyway, but yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from what, someone who may be a doctoral student does, and, and Mike would like to give 
uh, priority to doctoral student questions. Does ethics drive human behaviors and set norms or perhaps some business people care about ethics, set an example and others to follow? If no business case, how to study it? So if I understand the question correctly, does ethics drive human behaviors and set norms or perhaps some business people care about ethics, set an example and others to follow? So is it the people or the ethics that come first? Is that what the question is, Mike? I, I'm not sure, but maybe we can fold that into kind of Toby's point three about the distinction between individuals and organizations and Maybe get some because there are a lot of questions about that too. So you know, basically, who who is uh, who's acting in organizations if it's not people? Well, if I can jump in here, I mean, there's two issues there. I mean, I think that ethics is all about um, it is all about norms. Obviously, it's almost a tautology. And it also is about, it, it is about peer pressure. It's about conventions. It's about practices. And that's why I think industry leadership can be very important. Um, what we do in the classroom, as Danielle pointed up, is really important. Uh, what we come to think of as the right sort of behavior, because otherwise, if, if there aren't those norms, then people who behave a certain way uh, in business or elsewhere uh, can be shunned. I mean, ostracism, taboos, and things like that are certainly part of how we think about ethics. On Toby's point, though, so Toby, you wanted to take the position that um, corporations and individuals are different. Is that correct? Is that? Uh, yes, and so that's a that's an, yeah. an ethical point. So that the point does not have any uh, correlate in law because obviously corporations have no problem acting legally. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That's the whole point of uh, incorporation. Um, but the, the 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 issue is for ethics that what's what's it what's it, particularly for certain um, uh, certain ethical theories and or or we could or, uh, uh, drawing on Joanne's excellent points concerning um, meta ethics uh, certain certain accounts of motivation. Um, what is needed to motivate an individual to act ethically is not available to a, a to a corporation. Um, so there's a, there, there was a lot of work uh, done on this topic um, in business ethics. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, like 20 years ago was a, like a heyday. More than it, does, yeah. does a corporation have a conscience? So this is right. like foundational stuff in business ethics. Um, uh, does, it, does a corporation have a conscience? Um, is, it, is it possible for a, for, a, for a corporation to motivate the, 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 the will to do the right thing? Um, and as far as I understand it, the, the answer is just no, a, cor a corporation cannot act, a corporation isn't self-willed. Uh, individuals within the corporation are self-willed, but the mere fact that, uh, you know, someone in, um, someone in compliance uh, promulgates a particular ethical code and then people act in accordance with that code, that doesn't mean that they're acting ethically. They're, 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 um, uh, they may be acting ethically if they also evaluate the code and they and they agree with the code. But the um, uh, for for certain ethical theories, you have to be motivated in a in a particular way, and that's a that's a that's a problem for the um, uh, the the being driven by ethics aspect of the question. Mm -hmm. So you don't consider leadership. I mean, because there you have agency, you have a person. Um, so you can have people take leadership in organizations that make those organizations behave in a certain way. Absolutely. So the um, the so that's why I found uh, Wayne's focus on Tim Cook to be somewhat disarming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, because Tim Cook can be motivated in the correct way for for ethics. He's a he's a human being. He has a conscience. He has a he has intuitions. He has. Um, you know, he has ethical experiences that have shaped his intellect in particular ways and that lead him to prioritize certain concerns over others, to recognize uh, for himself when things, are, when things are right and wrong according to his own intellectual lights. Um, but Tim Cook, as powerful as he is, he's not all there is in Apple. And in particular, um, his, his directives don't necessarily, um, they, well, they don't, they can't direct the, um, 
the the people they can't direct Foxconn employees. I mean, in, in any way, he's he's not even within the chain of command with Foxconn employees. But even the uh, the managers who are who are who are making deals with Foxconn employees, he doesn't direct them in an in an ethical uh -huh. sense. That's the concern. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you want to, Wayne, chime, oh, chime in. Just a final thing. I thought um, Joanne's um, tribute to our um, conference um, organizer to Mike was, you know, appreciated and good. And just a final note to Mike to examine his own thinking on these issues of, you know, individuals and firms is Mike greatly to his credit for a person of his age, generation, and so on, has experience in a certain organization that my father and almost all men used to have experience in, the US military. Now, there really is, I believe, and that was why I went with what I thought was the gut of this. In all of our hearts is part of a feeling that working for a firm is like being a soldier. And it's especially true if you've been a soldier, I think. And I made my case that it's not, but for those of us who have the benefit of a different world, the military world, like Mike, I think your perspectives can perhaps be especially interesting on this. I'll leave it at that. I gotta be honest, I think probably my time at McDonald's had more uh, <laughs> On the way I think about managing and all that scientific <laughs> management stuff. But, uh, fair enough. Um, you know, unfortunately, we, we've hit the bewitching hour. So, you know, we're going to have to end questions. But I'm going to allow all of you to exercise free will and uh, including the panelists and decide if you want to stick around a bit longer and answer any remaining questions. But I'm going to formally end it here in a second. Um, and then we can, you know, go into overtime if, if people are willing. But let me read my spiel and then uh, we'll close it, uh, that part of this thing. Um, so a sincere thanks to the panelists for a great debate, of course. Thank you very much. And uh, many thanks to all of you for participating. As a reminder, the materials, including the reading list, slides, video, and chat, chat transcript will be posted very soon on our website. We'll send notice to all registered attendees, and you can find links on the RICSI website, which is at business.rutgers.edu slash RICSI, R-I-C-S-I. Please note that I've set up a Twitter account to use for refinements of any research questions. The Twitter handle is at research underscore better, and the title is better management research questions. If you'd like to provide brief summaries of any quasi seminar to post on the Rixi website, please get in touch with me. Uh, another thing to look for is the summer 2022 special issue of Rutgers Business Review. It'll be focused on this seminar series. Most of the presenters have agreed to write pieces for it that summarize and extend their debates. In addition, you might be interested in a call for papers for a special issue of Journal of Business Ethics titled Save Our Cities, Exploring the Intersection of Ethics, Diversity and Inclusion, and Social Innovation in Revitalizing Urban Environments. Ted Baker, Brett Gilbert, Kareem Post, Jeff Robinson, and I are the guest editors, and initial drafts are due on January 17th, 2022. You got some time. Uh, in addition, if you're interested in helping to create the next generation of business faculty, please visit mcnairbusinessscholars.org and sign up to be a mentor. Now, finally, please do join us for the next session in which we debate the question, however bad the question is, uh, can our research improve corporate social and environmental practices? <laughs> they got to be a yes, no thing. That's just the way they're um, That session will feature Mike Toffel, Andy King, Tom Lyon, and Ren Montgomery. It's on Friday, April 16th, just after tax day. Same bad time, same bad place. Hope to see you there. Thank you, uh, Deb. We can uh, close the recording and then uh, folks can stick around uh, at, their, at their leisure. <laughs>